Researchers often uh, have extensive insights into how people solve problems, including how the brain works and how decisions are made. Much of his of uh, the research focuses on metacognition or thinking about thinking. I really like that thinking about thinking because it means you're questioning and able to start deconstructing some things that may be complex, but uh, break them down. They might even be funny uh, or unusual or just uh, life-changing. Here are some highlights that relate to the keys to solving problems that are the focus of, uh, of what I'm speaking about here. The problem of solving problems. The process of solving problems is a complex but vital challenge. In a time when for the vast majority of people, work is not limited to routine tasks and manual skills, it is increasingly essential to be able to handle new situations, generate uh, multi-step solutions to new challenges, manage complex uh, information, and adjust plans based on feedback. The vast majority of workers today are confronted at least weekly with needing uh, to solve a complex problem that requires at least 30 minutes to figure out. These skills are particularly in demand in managerial, uh, professional, and technical fields. Uh, yet a study of 510,000 15-year-olds in 65 countries found that only 11% of the, uh, those participating at 15 years old uh, had those skills to solve the complex problems. Furthermore, one in five can only solve simple problems in familiar situations. The good news is that problem-solving mindset and skills beyond the specifics of subject matter problem solving can be actively strengthened in schools, homes, and other settings. Doing so prepares students to be successful, adapt, and thrive in a complex changing world. Um, we can get better at thinking about thinking in other words. Uh, sometimes when young people seem defiant or lazy, they may simply be experiencing symptoms of overloaded um, executive function systems. That means, you say, I can't handle it anymore. <laughs> uh, executive function or the ability to think about thinking uh, isn't well developed in children. So young people can't process all the information they receive as quickly as adults. Uh, so sometimes they make decisions based on their impulses or first reactions as they grow into adulthood. Young people get better at self-regulating their actions and feelings, which contributes to declines in risk-taking behaviors, which is good. Reducing the executive function uh, demands on children, such as giving one direction at a time or removing distractions from the immediate vicinity, can allow young people to practice their developing executive functional skills successfully. Uh, when they do that, they can learn more in the classroom because they are able to focus better on their teacher and their work. Uh, we have to have flexibility in managing our emotions and uh, passing this on to our students is very important. Uh, different people manage emotions in different ways in different situations. In their place, each of these uh, approaches there's two of them I'll talk about, can be healthy and productive. For example, we can distract ourselves from the emotional information so that it doesn't capture too much of our attention. So if we're worried about worrying too much or we're worried uh, about uh, doing this or that, uh, we can think about why and whether it's a good time to worry. We might even be able to, through metacognition, be able to uh, spend time on other things and only leave a few minutes worrying um, so we think of something else that is more emotionally neutral this is a tip this allows us to set aside the emotion until we can deal with it in a less stressful or emotionally intense situation or less stressful time we often find it today with our zoom classes or distance learning classes uh, students uh, and teacher 
are pretty stressed and focused. They feel like I gotta get this done and this done and this one. Uh oh, I missed this. Uh, because there's no longer a routine that they're used to uh, unless they have been practicing coming to class every day. If they don't do that, then they're gonna have to figure out to say, all right, I'm stressed out because I missed a few days or didn't get connected on Zoom and I can get caught up by breaking it down into small parts, for example. Um, if we deal with it this way, we can have, be less stressed when we're dealing with the parts as we were trying to simply uh, rush uh, to a complete end. We can take several days to get caught up in some cases, which is important. We can't uh, reappraise. Uh, another way to look at things is to say we cannot or we can reappraise the emotional information, which allows us to process the emotions more effectively. That is, we reframe the situation to make it less emotionally difficult. For example, a student may reappraise a low grade on a test by thinking of it not as an indication of failure, but as a signal of what he or she could do better to perform in, in the future. The student could also use reappraisal to influence how he or she thinks about himself or herself after a test. Uh, for example, the student could think about other good grades that he or she has received in the past as a way to dispel fear that he will always continue in this path of low grades. Uh, don't think that a limited ability is reflected in a test but your potential is still there. And remember, you did well in something else in school that day or in that week, or usually you do something well in school in general. Um, researchers at the U Stanford University found that people are more likely to pick reappraisal strategies when the situations are less emotionally intense. They are more likely to use distraction strategies when the issues are highly emotional. Researchers believe that flexibility in using the best strategy in a given situation is a key to emotional well-being. So, it's like this. There are no big problems, said Henry Ford. There are just a lot of little problems to work with. And uh, reframing uh, is a way to manage your emotions. Hi, Rob. Feedback, what makes it work? Solving problems often involves getting and receiving feedback. Educators see a key part of their role as providing feedback to students. Researchers find that this kind of feedback is most likely to be constructive when the following are true though. So teachers need to think about this. Students trust the person giving feedback. Number one, that if the students trust the, num the person giving feedback, uh, they can see criticism as criticism as information to help them improve, not resulting from bias, dislike, or another near, uh, motive. Number two, the feedback reflects the teacher's high standards and expectations, not a bias. Students believe they can make the changes, uh, excuse me, I'll read number two again. The feedback reflects the teacher's high standards and expectations, not a bias. Um, they think that it's just the high standards of the teacher, it's not a bias against them to really make a lot more of uh, emotional connection with the students too. Students believe they can make the changes needed to succeed, lessening the likelihood that the teacher doesn't really believe in them. This belief is reinforced through positive feedback on what they are doing well at already. So they can believe in the expected changes or anticipated changes coming to fulfillment uh, through the teacher's encouragement and uh, showing that he really believes that they can learn and as well to help them break it down to make it a way that they can uh, eliminate the emotional stress of learning. Number four, students must act, have access to the resources um, line, which would include positive feedback or specific feedback, excuse me so they can achieve the standards they have set. So if you get specific feedback, that's of course positive, uh, you're going to be very successful. If you just give feedback uh, that isn't very specific and positive, then you be a lot of other stuff. So try to give it with um, uh, very specific things that you know they can do. 
Uh, these three crap practices help all students, but they are particularly important for students who have faced biases or stereotypes. These practices, if used consistently, can enhance students' self-concept and performance, rebuilding a sense of trust in themselves and in others. And that's what we want to do, uh, is encourage students to trust in others and have others act in a way that's trusting to them. This is a cycle and a loop that we would love to be in, in our classroom and in our relationships with our students. However, it all starts at home. Young people are more likely to develop effective problem solving skills when they feel listened to at home. Participate in solving problems and making decisions at home and have other family members who want to work together to solve problems. These dynamics are most likely when they have warm, supportive relationships with both parents and siblings. Yeah, this is an ideal situation that most of us aren't in, but, but by having these experiences at home, young people learn that disagreements and problems can be resolved in relationships. This gives them greater confidence in themselves and their interaction with others. For more tools to families, I'd suggest uh, you go to parentfurther.com. Parentfurther is one word, dot com, uh, for building relationships with your kids at home that you might need uh, to help them succeed. The importance of self-management to achieve goals. I'll summarize right now. Young people who develop the skill to manage their own feelings and behaviors in order to achieve longer-term goals and manage executive function are better able than their peers to, one, focus and learn in the classroom, two, develop friendships, three, go to good jobs, and four, have fewer health problems than their peers who do not. So, I'm wishing you the best, and remember, uh, watch the video several times if you don't remember what we're talking about. Um, I, I suggest a variety of activities, and I'll try to put one up here soon on my blog of how you can learn to build relationships with your students early in the school year. All right, this is Kevin Stoda. Thank you for coming to the Kevin Stoda channel. Uh, become a subscriber and give us a thumbs up. We appreciate you being here. This is Kevin Stoda on the porch.